addresses? Is it about uh, internet access? Is it about the equipment? Or, or is it really just, you know, people being uncomfortable with certain things that, that, uh, that go on online? And lots of, lots of positives, constructive, you know, already, you know, ideas about how to address this. And a sense that there's an opportunity now. Um, so there's this medium to long term uh, strategic agenda, but there's opportunities now, like, for example, older people who pre COVID-19 were saying, look, I don't really want a computer, go away, <laughs> who might now be saying, I, I want a computer, or I want to be able to connect up with, with family, friends and, and services now, and opportunities to have donated devices and, and things like that. So th there's a, there's a you know, potential uh, opportunity to take action right now. And, um, and, and everybody's not looking at it just from their own organizational perspective. You know, so like a university looking at it from a well-being perspective, not just an educational perspective. Uh, everybody's, certainly what the impression I got from our session was everybody's taking a broad perspective. This isn't about fighting over, you know, a, a small pie. This is about together collaboratively baking a bigger pie. And it's not about saying we've only got a small number of computers. You know, let's, let's kind of look at the need and who misses out. Um, Potentially, you know, let's look at everybody who needs or wants a computer or, or a laptop or a, a smartphone. How would we how do we get that to them and how do we get the support to them? I think that's really important. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, and the, the, I think the thing with COVID-19 is that the um, it really brought to the fore this issue of devices and connectivity um, and, and people suddenly not being able to um, get this essential information online. And there's various schemes, some of them local, uh, some of them I know were mentioned in the chat like devices.now um, where um, the tablets were able to get to those that needed it. And yeah, well, I think it's worth more conversation. We've got quite a few hands up, but Helen, what's your thoughts on that? Going to comment. So Susan Wood from City York Council is working on a device reuse scheme as well. And as Rich mentioned, there's a few national ones, devices.now, uh, social biz books do this. And actually Bernardo's are working with Vodafone to get devices out, mainly to younger people in need as well. So we've got a hand up from Pauline. Pauline Stutchfield. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to, yeah. So, Pauline, we're going to unmute you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, again, a range of people in our, in our um, room, but uh, I think we were slightly council top heavy. Um, in terms of the challenges then, finding someone with the right expertise, you can have an expert, as I've got uh, one organisation had, had an expert on site or champion on site, but they were, they were an Apple user, Couldn't, didn't have a clue about Android, um, so, so it's having the, the right skills. Um, York Learning, working with, with Susan and others uh, and accessing reused items to, to allocate to, to learners, for example, can give out this, the tools, but if there's no Wi-Fi, no data, it, it's absolutely uh, pointless. Um, younger and disabled adults, younger people do t tend to have access to facilities, um, but other disabled ad uh, adults in homes, for example, may only have access to one PC that is used for other purposes. So struggling to get online at all, uh, and then you've got the connectivity issue. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, and linked to financial inclusion, the connectivity issue is often the cost of the internet or the data. So a plea to any of the um, uh, infrastructure providers on online around considering discounts um, or offers for, for, for people who, who may be either vulnerable or uh, in a, a financially difficult position. Um, uh, we're a digital city but people having str struggling to, to access it um, for those reasons uh, and a point made that, that Zoom and YouTube that people might want to use um, is data heavy. Um, so actually having a mechanism for people to uh, access unlimited or free Wi-Fi is, is, is key. Um, and then there is, um, uh, you know, getting online and then having a terrible experience if, if you're 
um, if you need, if you have any accessibility issues what, what, whatsoever, or, right. or anyone really having a terrible experience. And of course, the 2018 accessibility regulations uh, only apply to the public sector. Uh, um, and I'll come to some solutions around that in a minute. Um, uh, and I identify cat gap from personal experience of someone in the room uh, for around care staff knowledge um, uh, and um, supporting residents in homes uh, and uh, getting staff engaged um, to, 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 to learn and to support those those individuals so in, ter in terms of um, opportunities lots um, obviously digital jump champions either in person uh, or on a phone line Libraries are able to offer um, support for people with limited sight loss. Staff are all trained to support um, people. Um, uh, and then um, looking at the digital infrastructure uh, uh, and suppliers to support where they can. Um, clear a pathway for support for younger and disabled people. Recycling projects for kits. Um, enable Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi into homes or, or discounted Wi-Fi into homes. Um, make real um, opportunity for people uh, of the appetite um, that, that they've developed. I think uh, Paul mentioned this. At the moment, there is an appetite and it's exciting. Uh, let's make the most of it. Um, adult education team supporting rollout and support for um, carers. Uh, for example, so the, this, there is activity going on. Um, use of emergency funding for immediate support. So, so the council have uh, uh, emergency funding at the moment for um, data, for, for three months data. If, if there is anyone right now that is struggling to, to get access online. Um, and then... Um, Obviously, uh, there is the free Wi-Fi public network that we have in York and, and I can supply a map. I will try and get hold of it of where those zones are in communities, community centres, the university, for example, where people can go and sit and take their phones and, and use the data free. Um, libraries talked about, um, yes, people can use social media, um, uh, could access Zoom, etc., through the libraries. The the issue for them is 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 the confidential conversations, uh, and possibly talking about whether a private space can be made available within libraries, or or, or whether there's a good time for those calls to be made. Um, the, the the issue around uh, a terrible experience online and the accessibility regulations around having a local charter for for all organisations in York to meet accessibility standards. Um, and, and, and all contact centres, wherever they are, whether they're in the council or in the private sector, to improve the conversation. So if we're trying to channel shift someone for, for, to, to access services online rather than over the phone, that we have a quality conversation about what's stopping them doing that and how we can support them. Uh, and, and homes and care homes having digital charters as well, looking at maybe at JRF and the council to help support that. Thank you. Thank you. There's loads of good stuff there. Um, brilliant feedback. I've been trying to put some of that into Menti as well. On the point of discounted um, connections, we will share some resources on that as well. BT do have a um, a look, an offer for people on low incomes it's not amazing in terms of data but it is 10 pounds a month which is a lot less than some of the other providers and um, so we will pass around those uh, resources as well fantastic so we've got sorry rich were you gonna yeah i was just gonna say the same thing as you i think um we've got fiona with a hand raised in the in the group so i'm gonna um invite fiona to uh, give us some feedback. Uh, thanks very much. Um, well, first of all, it wasn't enough time. We just sort of got going and then it was counting down. It was very Don't stressful. Worry. Don't worry, there's another session coming. <laughs> all right. um, also, a really interesting group of, of people and organisations. And I've been in York since 2004, so I've been doing this for a while now and have had various um, 
goes at, at digital inclusion along the way, reaching different groups of people. And I have to say, I think this is the first time that we've really included such a wide range of organisations and it's really encouraging. And I think, you know, uh, very encouraging that actually this is really going to work because we're reaching the right people. I mean, our challenges were, um, as you would imagine, really, lack of hardware, um, a really big one, because obviously if you haven't got the hardware, you, you, you can't do anything. Um, and so that device reuse is so important. And having the right hardware, because you can have a smartphone, but if you need to do a job application, you really need a keyboard. So it's having the right, the right hardware to reach uh, different purposes. Um, fear, you know, huge one, perceptions of risk, whereas some people are, you know, terribly worried about doing something that actually, if you just talk them through it, they may have not really understood what it was and be worrying unduly. But equally, making sure that safety on the internet is a key part of anything. Um, so it's trying to un get people to understand how to be safe online without terrifying them. Um, and uh, and um, disability, all sorts of disabilities can be a challenge because it is having access to that right hardware and software. Um, and certainly in libraries, we have a whole range of those, but we're always looking to improve um, because, uh, because it, it, it updates constantly. So we can never just sit back on our laurels. And, and, in, and, and really interestingly, uh, just making the assumption that it's old people. Um, you know, I uh, don't have children, so I might assume that all young people are just born digital, you know, magically have those digital skills. Um, but that isn't the case always. And I think there's a real risk of, of a perception bias that all young people have got it. We don't need to worry about them. And so for me, I, I think there's a really interesting piece of work in looking at different age groups and what the different challenges might be for each of those. So, but really interesting discussion and not long enough. Great, thank you Fiona, some great points there. And certainly we'd echo what you say about young people. You know, when I talked about narrow users, what we, there is some evidence to suggest that there's a lot of young people who are brilliant at, you know, the social media side, but ask them to do a CV online or apply for a job and they, they struggle. So I um, would definitely echo that. Um, also the point that you made about people with disabilities. Um, I just wanted to flag, we've got um, uh, Dave Power from AbilityNet on the call today. Again, we'll send around the link and the resources, but AbilityNet are a fantastic organisation and they're all specialists in helping so, uh, people with any kind of disability or impairment to get online. And it's a free phone service. Um, so we'll send that round as well. And please do use that resource because um, there's so much wealth and knowledge there. It's fantastic. Great. So we've got next uh, Chris Streak from York Museums Trust. I'm going to unmute you, Chris, if you'd like to uh, feedback to us. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm just um, kind of um, going to reiterate what Fiona said really about the kind of the broad brush approach that young people are really kind of digitally amazing and older people are kind of obviously there's a bit more kind of work there um, and particularly from personal experience it's looking at kind of how do we identify those kind of core skills that the, the kind of fundamental core skills that kind of might be the kind of gateway to open uh, or help obviously the other kind of di digital skills to kind of come to the fore really um, and in a way I suppose it's kind of like a digital audit isn't it to kind of say you know you've got people who kind of say you know work in organizations larger organizations and obviously you know they may be able to use email or use a smartphone but again if you go outside that narrow user kind of scope or they don't or you know the change of hardware or something like that and then it all kind of cr comes crumbling down and I suppose it's that kind of how how do I identify you know those skills that are kind of lacking and how do we you know and when we say those are the core ones that need to be kind of improved and then kind of you know roll out the training or the kind of mentorship or or you know digital digital championing and things like that really um but yeah it's just i think it's just the you know it's just the broad brush sometimes it's, it's it's a bit more granular granular isn't it where we've got to kind of say you know um not all young people are amazing but, you know 
you know, digital skills. I'm still learning. I work on the digital team, and again, I've we we you know we're still learning as well. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Never, you never stop learning. And what we always say to anybody who wants to be a digital champion is, you know, nobody knows everything about every aspect of technology. It's about having that confidence to embrace the new. And, and it's, it's a lifelong learning mindset, I think. So, yeah, great points there. Sorry, Rich. Yeah, I was just going to draw the, there's a sort of um, tangent issue out around loneliness and isolation um uh, uh and sometimes um there's an assumption again that broad brush assumption that young people are all digitally connected and therefore don't experience uh loneliness um or don't struggle with isolation uh, in the same ways as older people do and that's not really uh, you know a benefit that's sought after or needed um but um more recent research of the bbc did a huge loneliness survey in 2018 and it was quite uh, enlightening that um, young, more younger people were experiencing loneliness than older people and were experiencing it to a greater degree. So a kind of more intense um, experience of loneliness, uh, kind of busting the myth um, compared to lots of feedback that came from older people that were saying, yes, loneliness was an issue and isolation could be an issue. Um, but that actually the, the, the feelings around that um, weren't as troublesome, weren't as, We've lost weren't as difficult to knock off your video. experience by young people. The fact that people, even if connections, uh, yeah, they may not, exp um, they may not, uh, there we go, stop my video but they may um, still experience loneliness um, uh, as a result. Digital connection isn't always the solution for those. Thank you. Next, we've got Emma from um, City of York Housing, I think. So I'm going to unmute you, Emma. Hello. Hi, Emma. Hi. Yeah, our group again, it was a varied amount of people from various different organizations and i think we were saying something from a housing background that obviously a big barrier is poverty and chaotic lifestyles and abilities and all sorts of things sorry i'm distracted i've got a cat walking across the front of the screen any minute now <laughs> i'm just pushing him out of the way um and it's not just so in york we've got this great infrastructure that's been laid down from a connectivity point of view but actually it's people being able to afford to use that so even if we initially could provide or whatever organizations could provide the equipment how do people therefore maintain the payment of that and i think that's a massive barrier certainly for us in the social housing sector and i would imagine wider than than just us um we have we've worked with susan woods as well the digital inclusion team we've provided equipment for the older people but again we've also said that it's not just those people that need the equipment it goes across the board and you've got to look at how you tap into those people and initially how you sustain their use of equipment how you sustain their interest in engaging with us so there's 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 quite a large barrier in how you get that information out to these people who aren't tech savvy in the first place because certainly from our organization a lot of the time it's put everything on the website brilliant if you can't access it you can't access it you're never going to know that information so how do you put that out then i suppose that's one of the big challenges that we found ourselves yeah absolutely yeah poverty and you know people call it data poverty fuel poverty food poverty food. it's all of it yeah poverty and it's a huge issue and sadly with the news in the, this morning about the recession yeah. this is a global way you know there are people um you know, losing their jobs because of um the crisis mm. so absolutely important that we work together recognize those issues and trying to put some solutions in place for that thank you for that okay. we've got eleanor too if i if i pronounce your surname correctly but eleanor i'm going to unmute you now and would you like to uh, share back with us from the group and thanks emma hi eleanor Hi, Eleanor. Did you right. want to... Uh, no, I'm muted. Oh, um, I can hear you now. Thank the you. Equality Act, the 2010 Equality Act, which replaced the Dis Disability Discrimination Act, 
has not been enforced. Bringing prosecutions under the Act is difficult. You have to be directly affected. I heard a talk by a um, power chair user who has brought cases successfully against places that don't have ramps so that she can't get into their premises. Now, it's not easy bringing those cases. She's helped other people to do it. Um, website accessibility is a service that should be covered by the Equality Act. And I don't know whether there would be any legal assistance available to people like me who might want to prosecute people for their inaccessible websites. Yes, it's a really good point. And um, as I think Pauline mentioned, there has been new legislation to make public sector organisations conform to accessibility standards. But as yet, there isn't this um, same legislation to apply to all organisations. Um, I would certainly you know, welcome some um, pressure on local politicians to, to highlight that issue. Um, you will find that there are um, quite um, a lot of the bigger organizations, for example, Microsoft, Apple, Google, uh, they're all really, really hot on accessibility. And there's a very buoyant um, accessibility developer network. Um, some of the innovation that you see in technology is a direct result of people with disabilities. For example, the raising hand um, bit that you can see on Zoom, that's feedback obviously from um, people with impairments and also things that we all use every day like the typewriter was actually invented for a blind person. So it's something that I think the technology community are quite hot on. Um, but it, it hasn't filtered through to all websites and I would certainly echo that and I think someone else mentioned perhaps having a maybe it was Pauline having a local accessibility charter you know you've got a, buy, a buoyant tech sector in York um, it would be a great idea to try and put some pressure and improve those websites for all absolutely great point thank you and lastly we've got Sue, Sue Lister if I can unmute you Sue if you'd like to um, share your thoughts with the group. Surely good. So I got quite passionate and, and the more I'm hearing, I'm, I'm getting more passionate about the fact that it's my human right not to be, um, I have, I, uh, so I've got about 150 people. Of those 140 people can receive emails and 10 people don't want to receive emails. They want to receive phone calls and they want to meet personally. So we, I'm saying to everybody, it's, it's our human right. We need to respect the fact that it's our human right not to be digital, digit, digitally included. And therefore it behooves everybody to be aware when you're trying to be inclusive that you don't exclude the people who don't want to be digitally included. And therefore you don't want to close post offices. You don't want to stop telephoning people. You don't want to stop having um, paper uh, arriving through, letters arriving through your door. You don't want to stop all that while you are offering digital inclusion to everybody so that the government or whatever in the COVID-19 only putting all its information through certain online um, methods, channels, was, was not good enough. It was not good enough because you, we're in an, a, a, an era of change and transition and you cannot just say right this is where we're heading so that's where you've got to go to while you've all got this lot here who are not so my question is are you going to wait for us to die off or are you going to include us all the way through 
until we die off. That's my point of view. It's a great point of view and a tough question. I, I would just sort of like to jump in with um, Citizens Online have been going since 2000, um, trying to do the inclusion piece and to try and support that at all kinds of levels in terms of persuading um, government and lobbying government, trying to support good practice um, in the areas. But uh, I'm completely in agreement with you. The internet is a, is a choice. Using, using digital services is and should be a choice. Um, we are now in a world where so much um, is, is created um, as digital by default. You know, there's no other way to do it. If you want to make a universal credit claim, you have to do it online. And if you, if you can't do it online, the only ways you can really do it is to get someone to help you um, input those details um, or get them ultimately to, to do it for you in an assisted digital kind of way. Um, so I'm... <sighs> I really do advocate the, that it should be a choice. Um, and um, are we going to wait for everyone to, to die off? I, I just don't think that's the question. Um, I think it's a tough one. Uh, it's not where we're coming from as an organization and not, not where we um, believe the work needs to be done. It, it's about continuing with that journey of choice and inclusivity. I see, I see you, Can I just uh, say that it's not only a question of choice. People, you, you listed your motivation, poverty, disability. Poverty is going to continue. Disability is going to continue. Connectivity is going to continue. Fear is going to continue. Literacy is going to continue. All these reasons for people not being online will be continuing. So you need to take that into account. Absolutely. I would echo Rich's point, you know, and I think that it's something that we would always say at Citizens Online. There are always going to be people who, uh, you know, do, don't, either don't want to or can't actually use the internet unaided. What we would advocate is that um, obviously the more people who do things online, the more resources available to help those who don't want to. And that there are always going to be that, those people. Um, and I think all public services, it isn't about you know, insisting that people do things online. Although Rich gave a great example with universal credit, I should just say that they have changed the policy on that now because they've listened to feedback and you can do a claim that doesn't have to be online, but they don't make it easy at all. Um, so I would totally agree with you. The one thing that I would point out is it's all right you know, not wanting to do that sort of thing. You don't want to do something online or you don't want to um, engage with someone on the internet. What COVID is, is sadly you know, shown society is that sometimes there isn't a choice. If you're isolated in your home, if you are high risk and you can't go to a shop, you can't go to a post office, if you, can't, if you don't have the ability to do that online and that isn't about a choice, then you're a much more disadvantage. And I understand people's choice. And I think, as we said in the chat, it's not about telling people what's for them or what they can do. But I think in COVID times when people are vulnerable and people are shielding, yes, there are volunteers to help do things over the phone. But if you had the the own ability to do that online, I think a lot of people would find that reassuring. So if people a choice is one thing, but the actual ability and the enabling of people to be able to do it is another as well. And I would like to make sure or hope that a group, um, you know, could support people to have that enabling, to have the ability to to do that if they choose. But thank you. Definitely a great point. Speaking of which, I can see um, Dave Power's ability net uh, hand raised in the chat. Yeah. Welcome, Dave. We're going to unmute you now. Thank you, Sue. Hello, Dave, can you unmute? I'm trying to ask you to unmute. I think you had your hand up. Yeah, right, okay. Oh, so what I was gonna say is there's a couple of things. 
particularly for say the libraries in there, um, are the digital champions in the libraries, do they feel confident about delivering the training that they would normally do for those people who can't get into the libraries at the moment because of COVID-19 restrictions? Um, AbilityNet does have a set of videos that are available on YouTube which describe how to use some of the remote support tools um, and for counsellors some of this will require some funding. I don't know the precise numbers but I'm certain I can pass you to a person negotiated for us that can give you the costs to, to be able to do remote support so that anybody who can't get into a library can, you can still provide that same level of support to people in homes. The other one which I saw around there is uh, some references on the notes around there associated with um, visual impairment issues. You are aware that RNIB uh, has a set of volunteers who also provide uh, support for individuals and I happen to coordinate the service in this area for RNIB and I've not seen any requests coming through. So if there's anybody who's got a visual impairment who needs assistance, you can either come to ourselves if you want remote support or you could go to RNIB. Uh, they're still running their remote support service, although some of aspects because of a visual impairment, it can be difficult to uh, set up a remote training session. Thank you. That's really helpful, Dave, and we'll make sure that we, um, as I said, we'll circulate AbilityNet's details and we'll also include um, RNIB in there as well. We've got Leonard Cheshire um, on the call as well, and they have a service too. So yeah, it's about everybody um, helping each other and supporting each other. So please do publicize those offers to people. Okay, so we have had amazing feedback there and I hope you can see it scrolling on the Menti screen. We've also captured this in the chat. And as I said, we are recording this session now. So when people are talking, that's all recorded. Um, we were planning to jump into another breakout session now. Um, 